Hey folks, I know I am just an old guy telling stories, but please leave a like and subscribe before we start. Let's enjoy in today's stories. Before I dive into today's stories, I want to say disclaimer. Even though the places in the stories are real, the content presented in this video is purely for entertainment purposes. The theories discussed are speculative and are not supported by concrete evidence. They are not intended to be taken as factual information. Viewer discretion is advised. Enjoy. Hey everyone, I've been debating for a while whether or not to share this, but after seeing some of the other crazy stories on here, I figured why not. Maybe someone can help me make sense of it all, or at least I can get it off my chest. So here goes. A few months ago, I was down one of those infamous internet rabbit holes. You know the kind, one minute you're watching cute cat videos, the next you're watching a 10-part documentary on the most obscure conspiracy theories out there. It was late, I was bored, and I ended up in the darker corners of the web, a place I had always been curious about but too cautious to explore deeply. I stumbled upon a forum that claimed to have leaked documents from Area 51. Yeah, I know it sounds ridiculous, but curiosity got the better of me, and I started reading. The threads were full of people arguing about the legitimacy of the documents, with some swearing they were real while others called out obvious photoshopped images. But then, I found a post from a guy named Unseen Truth that caught my attention. Unseen Truth claimed to have worked at Area 51 and had proof of the government's interactions with extraterrestrial beings. It was the kind of thing you'd laugh off if it weren't for the detail he provided. He described secret hangars, underground labs, and even meetings between high-ranking officials and alien representatives. His post was filled with technical jargon and insider terminology that seemed too complex to be fabricated by some random internet troll. He had attached several documents to his post, redacted reports, schematics of what he claimed were alien vehicles, and even a supposed blueprint for a UFO. Skeptical but intrigued, I downloaded the files. The schematics were incredibly detailed, far beyond my understanding, but they looked legitimate. The blueprint for the UFO was the most fascinating. It detailed the materials, the energy source, even the propulsion system, which was way beyond anything I'd ever heard of. But the real kicker was a video file. Unseen Truth claimed it was footage of a landing zone within Area 51 where aliens could come and go as they pleased, making deals with the government. I hesitated before clicking play, my heart pounding in my chest. The video quality was grainy, and the timestamp suggested it was from the late 90s. In it, you could see a circular area surrounded by high fences and armed guards. Then, a bright light appeared in the sky, growing larger until it resolved into a classic saucer-shaped UFO. It descended slowly, landing on the marked pad. The video cut off abruptly after that leaving me with more questions than answers. I know how all this sounds. Trust me, if someone else was telling me this story, I'd think they were nuts. But there was something about the way Unseen Truth wrote and the evidence he provided that felt real. He mentioned that the aliens were not only cooperating with the government, but were also involved in developing advanced weapons and vehicles. According to him, they had been doing this for decades, under the guise of top-secret military projects. I spent hours poring over the documents, my mind racing with possibilities. What if it was all true? What if the government really was hiding something this big? The more I read, the more paranoid I became. I started noticing odd things. Strange cars parked near my house, unusual clicks on my phone line. Maybe it was just my imagination running wild but it felt like someone was watching me. I decided to message Unseen Truth directly, thanking him for sharing the information and asking if he had any more proof. It took a few days, but he finally replied. His message was short and cryptic. Be careful. They know who you are now. Trust no one. That's when I realized I might be in over my head. I had uncovered something that was never meant to see the light of day, and now I was part of the conspiracy. Whether it's true or not, I can't say for certain. But the fear I felt was real, and it hasn't left me since. So, there it is. 
I know it sounds crazy, and maybe it is, but something in those documents and that video felt genuine. If any of you have any thoughts or advice, I'm all ears, because right now, I don't know what to believe, and that's the scariest part of all. Hey guys, it's me again. Thanks for all the support and advice after my first post. I didn't expect such a big response, and it's good to know I'm not alone in this. So, as promised, here's what happened next. After getting that cryptic message from Unseen Truth, I felt a mix of dread and excitement. The paranoia was getting to me. I started double-checking the locks on my doors, keeping the blinds closed, and even avoiding my usual routes to work. I knew I was probably overreacting, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. One night, about a week after my initial dive into the dark web, I was scrolling through the news, trying to distract myself, when I noticed something odd. There was a small, easily overlooked article about a fire at a research facility near Area 51. The article was vague, saying only that the fire was quickly contained and that no one was injured. But what caught my eye was a photo accompanying the article. Barely visible in the background, there was a symbol that matched one of the logos on the documents Unseen Truth had shared. It was a small detail, but it felt significant. I couldn't help but think the fire was a cover-up for something bigger. Maybe someone was trying to destroy evidence. I saved the article and decided to dig deeper into the facility. The next few days were a blur of research. I spent every free moment looking into the facility and any connections it might have with Area 51. What I found was both fascinating and terrifying. The facility was officially a weather research station, but several sources hinted at classified projects and government contracts. There were whispers of strange experiments and sightings of unmarked black helicopters in the area. I tried reaching out to Unseen Truth again, hoping he could provide more context. Days went by with no response and I started to worry. What if something had happened to him? Then, late one night, I received another message from him. It was brief and to the point. Meet me. Tomorrow, midnight. Coordinates attached. My heart raced as I looked up the coordinates. They pointed to a remote location in the Nevada desert, not far from Area 51. I knew it was risky, but I had to go. I needed answers, and this might be my only chance. The next night I drove out to the meeting spot, my mind racing with possibilities. The desert was eerily quiet, the only sounds the crunch of gravel under my tires and the distant call of coyotes. I arrived at the coordinates just before midnight, parking my car behind a cluster of rocks. I waited, the silence pressing in on me. Minutes felt like hours, but finally I saw headlights approaching. A beat-up old truck pulled up beside me and a man stepped out. He looked exactly how I imagined, disheveled, with dark circles under his eyes and a nervous energy about him. He introduced himself as Unseen Truth. Though he never gave me his real name, we talked for hours and he revealed even more than I expected. According to him, the fire at the research facility was indeed a cover-up. He claimed they had been experimenting with alien technology and something had gone wrong. The government had swooped in to contain the situation and destroy any evidence. He told me about the deals the government had made with extraterrestrials, trading technology for resources and information. He said the aliens had been visiting Earth for centuries, but only in recent decades had they established formal contact. They were interested in our planet's resources and our genetic material, though he didn't go into much detail about what that meant. The most chilling part of our conversation was when he mentioned the weapons. He said the government was developing advanced weapons using alien tech, things far beyond our current capabilities. He warned me that these weapons could change the balance of power in the world and that there were factions within the government willing to use them, no matter the cost. I asked him why he was telling me all this, why he had risked so much to leak the documents. He looked at me, a haunted look in his eyes, and said, People need to know the truth. 
We can't let them keep this secret any longer. The world deserves to know what's really going on. We parted ways as dawn broke, and I drove home in a daze, my mind buzzing with everything he had told me. I knew I had to share this, but I also knew the risks. I was now part of something much bigger than myself, and there was no turning back. So here I am, sharing this with all of you. I don't know what to believe anymore, but I know that something is going on, something that goes far beyond what we've been told. If anyone has any more information or advice, please let me know. This isn't just my story anymore. It's all of ours. Hey again, everyone. Thanks for sticking with me through this crazy journey. After my meeting with Unseen Truth, things started to get even weirder. I hope you're ready for what comes next because it only gets stranger from here. After our conversation, I spent the next few days trying to process everything. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every time I went outside, I felt eyes on me. I started noticing the same car parked on my street, the same people passing by my house. Paranoia was setting in hard, and I knew I had to be careful. One evening, while I was reviewing the documents again, my computer screen suddenly went black. At first, I thought it was just a glitch, but then a line of text appeared. You've been warned. My heart pounded in my chest. Someone had hacked into my computer. I quickly unplugged it and sat there in the dark, trying to calm my racing thoughts. The next day, I decided to take a break and clear my head. I went for a walk in a nearby park, trying to shake off the paranoia. As I was walking, I noticed a man following me at a distance. He was dressed in plain clothes, but there was something about him that screamed, government agent. I quickened my pace and so did he. My heart raced as I ducked into a coffee shop, hoping to lose him in the crowd. I watched from the window as he stopped outside, scanning the area. After a few tense minutes, he moved on, and I finally breathed a sigh of relief. But I knew this wasn't over. They were on to me, and I needed to be more careful than ever. When I got home, I found a plain envelope on my doorstep. No return address, just my name typed on the front. I brought it inside and carefully opened it. Inside was a single sheet of paper with a typed message. Stop digging, or there will be consequences. No signature, no clue who had sent it. But the message was clear. They wanted me to stop. That night I couldn't sleep. I kept replaying everything in my head, wondering if I had gone too far. But then I remembered Unseen Truth's words. People need to know the truth. I knew I couldn't back down now. I decided to reach out to a journalist friend of mine. I figured if anyone could help me make sense of this, it was her. We met in a quiet cafe and I told her everything. She listened intently, taking notes and asking questions. When I showed her the documents and the video, her eyes widened in shock. This is huge, she said. If this is real, it could change everything. She agreed to look into it further and promised to keep me updated. I felt a bit of relief knowing that I wasn't alone in this anymore. But I also knew that things were about to get even more dangerous. A few days later, I received a call from my journalist friend. She sounded shaken. I've been followed, she said. My apartment was broken into last night. They didn't take anything, but they left a message. They know I'm involved. We agreed to meet in a public place, somewhere we wouldn't be easily followed. She handed me a flash drive. I found some more information, she said, but be careful. They're watching us. I took the flash drive home and plugged it into an old laptop, one I hadn't used in years and wasn't connected to any of my accounts. The files contained more detailed information about the research facility and its connection to Area 51. There were internal memos, project reports, and even more blueprints for advanced technology. One document stood out. It was a report on an incident involving an alien craft that had crash-landed. According to the report, the craft was recovered and brought to the facility for study. The alien inside had survived and was being held in a secure location. 
The report detailed attempts to communicate with the being and the technology found inside the craft. Reading this sent chills down my spine. If this was real, it meant that the government had been in contact with extraterrestrials for decades, possibly longer, and they had gone to great lengths to keep it a secret. As I was going through the files, I received another message from Unseen Truth. They know you have the information. Be prepared to leave at a moment's notice. I packed a bag with essentials and kept it by the door. I knew I couldn't stay here much longer. They were closing in, and I needed to be ready to disappear if it came to that. So, here I am, sharing this with all of you once again. Things are getting dangerous, and I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'll keep you updated as best I can. Stay safe, everyone, and remember, you deserve to know the truth, no matter how terrifying it might be. Hey everyone, it's been a wild ride and I'm back to share the next part of my story. Thanks for all the support and advice so far. Your encouragement has kept me going through all the craziness. After receiving Unseen Truth's warning, I spent the next few days in a state of constant vigilance. Every noise outside my house made me jump. Every unfamiliar face set my heart racing. I knew I couldn't live like this forever, but I also knew I couldn't just let this go. The truth was too important. One night, as I was reviewing the files from the flash drive my journalist friend gave me, I received another message from Unseen Truth. This time it was more urgent. I have a contact who can help you. Meet him at the old train station, 3 a.m. Be careful. The old train station was a derelict building on the outskirts of town, long abandoned and overgrown with weeds the perfect place for a secret meeting. I dressed in dark clothes and made my way there, avoiding the main roads and sticking to side streets. The station was dark and silent, the only light coming from a flickering street lamp nearby. I waited in the shadows, my nerves on edge. After what felt like an eternity, a man emerged from the darkness. He looked to be in his late forties with a weathered face and eyes that had seen too much. He introduced himself as Michael, though I had a feeling that wasn't his real name. Michael didn't waste any time. He handed me a small encrypted USB drive. This contains everything you need to blow this wide open, he said. But you have to be careful. They're watching both of us. He went on to explain that he used to work for a contractor affiliated with Area 51. He had seen things things that convinced him that the public needed to know the truth. He had been collecting evidence for years, waiting for the right moment to come forward. We talked for a while longer, and he told me about the shadowy figures who had tried to silence him. They had ruined his career, alienated him from his family, and made him a fugitive in his own country. But he was determined to expose the truth, no matter the cost. As we were talking, Michael suddenly tensed up, We've been followed, he whispered. We need to move. He led me through a maze of abandoned buildings, constantly checking over his shoulder. We finally emerged onto a quiet street and he handed me a burner phone. Take this, he said. I'll contact you when it's safe. With that, he disappeared into the night, leaving me alone with my thoughts and a sense of growing dread. I made my way back home constantly looking over my shoulder, expecting to see those shadowy figures at any moment. When I got home, I plugged the USB drive into my old laptop. The files were encrypted, but Michael had given me the password. Inside, I found a treasure trove of documents, photos, and videos, detailed reports of alien encounters, blueprints for advanced technology, and even more evidence of the government's cover-up. One document in particular caught my eye. It was a report on a recent alien visit to Area 51. The report detailed a meeting between high-ranking officials and an alien delegation. According to the report, the aliens had come to renegotiate their agreement, demanding more resources in exchange for their technology. The report mentioned something about genetic material and human subjects, which sent a chill down my body. 
There were also photos, blurry but unmistakable, of alien crafts and even a few of the beings themselves. They looked eerily similar to the classic depictions. Large heads, big black eyes, spindly bodies. It was hard to believe, but the evidence was overwhelming. The videos were the most disturbing. Grainy footage of experiments being conducted on what looked like alien technology, and even more chilling on human subjects. I couldn't watch for long. The images were too disturbing. I saved everything to multiple locations, making sure I had backups in case something happened to the original files. I knew I had to share this with the world, but I had to be smart about it. The people behind this cover-up were powerful and ruthless. I decided to reach out to a few trusted contacts, people I knew I could rely on to help me get the information out safely. As I prepared to go public, I received another message from Unseen Truth. They know what you have. Be ready to run. My paranoia was justified. The next day I noticed more strange cars in my neighborhood, more unfamiliar faces. It was clear that they were closing in, and I needed to act fast. So here I am, sharing this with all of you once again. The evidence is out there, and I'm working with a few trusted people to get it to the right hands. This isn't just about me anymore. It's about exposing the truth and holding those responsible accountable. I don't know what's going to happen next, but I promise to keep you all updated as best I can. Stay safe, everyone, and remember, we have the right to know the truth, no matter how terrifying it might be. Hey everyone, it's been a crazy ride and I'm here to give you the final part of my story. I want to thank everyone who's been following along and offering support. It's meant more to me than you know. After receiving the warning from Unseen Truth that they were closing in, I knew I had to act fast. The paranoia was at an all-time high, and I couldn't afford to be careless. I packed a few essentials, grabbed the burner phone Michael had given me, and left my home, not sure when or if I'd be back. I drove to a safe house, a cabin in the woods that a friend had offered me years ago, just in case I ever needed to disappear. It was isolated, with no neighbors for miles, and it had a secure internet connection that couldn't easily be traced. From there, I reached out to my journalist friend and a few other trusted contacts. We coordinated a plan to release the information in a way that would be impossible to ignore. We decided to go through multiple reputable news outlets, ensuring that the story couldn't be easily suppressed. We spent days organizing the files, verifying the information, and preparing a detailed report. The evidence was overwhelming. Documents, photos, videos, all pointing to a massive cover-up involving extraterrestrial beings and advanced technology. The public needed to see this, and we were determined to make it happen. Finally, the day came. We released the report simultaneously through several major news outlets, along with the full set of documents, photos, and videos. The reaction was immediate and explosive. Social media was flooded with posts, debates, and theories. News channels covered the story nonstop and government officials were forced to respond. At first, the government tried to discredit the information, calling it a hoax and a fabrication. But as more and more evidence surfaced, their denials became less convincing. Independent experts began to verify the documents, confirming their authenticity. The pressure mounted, and it became clear that the truth could no longer be hidden. In the midst of all this, I received one last message from Unseen Truth. Well done. Stay safe. I haven't heard from him since, but I hope he's out there somewhere, knowing that his bravery helped expose one of the biggest secrets in human history. The fallout from the revelations was immense. There were congressional hearings, protests, and a public outcry for transparency and accountability. The government was forced to admit that they had been in contact with extraterrestrial beings for decades and had been developing advanced technology based on alien knowledge. The revelations also sparked a new era of scientific inquiry and exploration. Researchers around the world began to study the alien technology leading to breakthroughs in energy, medicine, and transportation. 
It was a turning point for humanity, opening up possibilities we had only dreamed of. As for me, I've had to stay under the radar. The people behind the cover-up are still out there, and they're not happy about being exposed. But I don't regret anything. The truth is out, and that's what matters. I've decided to keep moving, staying one step ahead of those who might want to silence me. But I'm not alone. There's a growing community of people dedicated to uncovering the truth and holding those in power accountable. And I know that together, we can make a difference. So that's my story. It's been a wild ride and it's far from over. But I'm hopeful for the future. We've taken the first step toward a new era of openness and discovery. And I believe that the best is yet to come. Stay safe, everyone, and keep seeking the truth. We deserve to know what's really out there. I've always been a tech enthusiast, dabbling in various corners of the internet. One late night curiosity led me to the dark web, a place I had often heard about, but never dared to explore deeply. That night I found myself in a chat room filled with conspiracy theorists and supposed whistleblowers. Most of it was the usual nonsense, aliens, government cover-ups, secret societies. But one user caught my attention. His username was Whistleblower51. Whistleblower51 claimed to be an ex-employee from Area 51. At first I rolled my eyes, but his detailed knowledge and the calm, almost clinical way he presented his information intrigued me. He said he was on the run because he had stolen a USB stick filled with classified data that the public was never meant to see. According to him, the government was conducting experiments that would make even the most hardened skeptics shiver. He started with a bombshell. They're working on time travel with alien technology. He explained that during the infamous Roswell incident, not only did they recover a spacecraft, but they also found alien technology that could manipulate time. Scientists at Area 51 had been working tirelessly to reverse engineer this tech. According to Whistleblower 51, they had limited success. He described it as crude and unpredictable, but enough to send objects a few seconds into the past or future. The chat room buzzed with excitement and skepticism. I was hooked. I needed more. Whistleblower 51 shared bits and pieces over the next few days, each more unsettling than the last. He claimed that the government wasn't just interested in time travel. They were also working on cloning humans to create super soldiers. Imagine an army of perfect soldiers, all cloned from the best specimens humanity has to offer, he wrote. They're not just identical. They're enhanced, stronger, faster, more resilient. But it didn't stop there. He revealed that they were developing advanced AI technologies designed to control these super soldiers. The AI was supposedly capable of learning and adapting in ways that were almost human-like. It's like giving them a brain, he said. Only this brain is devoid of empathy, fear, or hesitation. As I read these messages, a cold shiver ran down my spine. It sounded like something out of a science fiction novel, but the way Whistleblower 51 described it, with such specific details and a sense of urgency, made it feel disturbingly real. I remember one particular night when Whistleblower 51 dropped a link to a file-sharing site. This is it, he wrote. Proof. My heart raced as I clicked on the link. The file was a series of documents and videos. The first document was a series of memos from what appeared to be high-ranking officials discussing the progress of the time travel experiments. One memo mentioned a successful test where a small object was sent 10 seconds into the past. Another detailed the ethical concerns of cloning and how they were mitigated by selecting subjects who were deemed expendable. The videos were grainy likely recorded with hidden cameras. The first video showed a lab with what looked like a futuristic machine in the center. Scientists in white lab coats bustled around, making adjustments and taking notes. Then there was the cloning facility. Rows of pods lined the walls, each containing a human figure in various stages of development. The most chilling video, though, was of a training exercise. Cloned soldiers moved in perfect unison, 
executing commands with terrifying precision, their faces expressionless. I sat there, staring at my screen, a mix of disbelief and fear. If this was real, it was beyond comprehension. But there was also a part of me that questioned the authenticity. Could this all be an elaborate hoax? After all, the dark web is notorious for its mix of truth and fiction. Still, the thought of such experiments being real was enough to keep me glued to my computer, waiting for the next revelation from Whistleblower 51. That's when he dropped the biggest bombshell of all. They know I'm leaking this, I don't have much time. If anything happens to me, promise me you'll share this with the world. I didn't know what to believe. Was this guy for real? Or was he just another troll seeking attention? I decided to stick around and see where this rabbit hole would lead. Little did I know, this was just the beginning of a series of events that would change my life forever. After that night, I became obsessed with Whistleblower 51's revelations. Every day I would check the chat room hoping for more information. A few days passed with nothing new and I began to worry. Had something happened to him? One night my fears were confirmed. Whistleblower 51 posted a frantic message. They found me, I'm on the run. If you don't hear from me again, share everything I've posted. The world needs to know. My heart pounded as I read his words. The chat room exploded with speculation and concern. Who were they? How did they find him? I decided to take action. I downloaded everything he had shared so far, creating backups on multiple devices. I wasn't sure if I believed everything he said, but if there was even a grain of truth to his claims, it was worth preserving. A few days later, a new user appeared in the chat room. His username was Seeker, and he claimed to have seen Whistleblower 51 in person. According to Seeker, Whistleblower 51 was now hiding in a remote location, constantly on the move to avoid capture. He said Whistleblower 51 had managed to send him more files before going completely dark. Seeker shared a new batch of documents and videos. These were even more disturbing than the last. One document detailed an experiment involving time travel on living subjects. The memo described how animals were used initially, but there were plans to test on human subjects soon. The ethical concerns were brushed aside with a chilling phrase. The potential benefits outweigh the moral implications. The new videos were equally unsettling. One showed a test subject, a small animal, disappearing and reappearing in a different part of the room. The timestamp on the video showed a difference of 15 seconds. Another video captured a briefing where scientists discussed the potential of using time travel as a weapon. Imagine sending a bomb back in time, one scientist said. We could change the course of history without anyone knowing. But it wasn't just time travel that they were experimenting with. Another document discussed AI integration with cloned soldiers. The goal was to create an army that could think and act independently without the need for human commanders. The AI was designed to learn from every mission, improving its tactics and strategies. Autonomous warfare, the document called it. The most chilling document, though, was a list of names. These were people who had been volunteered for the cloning experiments. The list included homeless individuals, prisoners, and even some reported missing persons. It seemed that the government was willing to use anyone they deemed expendable for their experiments. One night, while sifting through these files, I received a private message from Seeker. They're watching me too, he wrote. I think they're on to us. We need to be careful. His message was followed by a string of code, coordinates. Meet me here. We need to talk in person. My heart raced as I considered his proposition. Meeting a stranger from the dark web in person went against every instinct I had. But curiosity and a sense of duty compelled me. If what Whistleblower 51 and Seeker said was true, the world needed to know. I decided to go. The coordinates led me to an old abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. It was the perfect place for a secret meeting. I arrived just before midnight, my nerves on edge. The warehouse was dark and silent, except for the occasional rustle of leaves in the wind. 
I spotted a figure standing in the shadows. Seeker? I called out, my voice barely above a whisper. The figure stepped forward and I saw a young man, probably in his late twenties with a nervous expression. You came, he said, relief evident in his voice. We moved deeper into the warehouse where Seeker showed me a laptop. I've been trying to piece together Whistleblower 51's data, he explained. There's so much more than we realized. He opened several files, showing detailed schematics of the cloning pods and the AI integration systems. This isn't just science fiction. It's real, and it's happening now. Suddenly, we heard a noise. A car engine, followed by footsteps. They're here, Seeker whispered, his face pale. We need to go now. We grabbed the laptop and fled through a back exit, running as fast as we could. As we reached the edge of the property, I glanced back and saw men in dark suits entering the warehouse. We had barely escaped. We spent the night in a cheap motel going through the files and planning our next move. Seeker was convinced that we needed to go public, to share everything we had with the media. It's the only way to stay safe, he argued, if everyone knows they can't silence us. But I wasn't so sure. What if no one believed us? What if we were just putting ourselves in more danger? As dawn approached, we agreed to split up, to continue our investigation separately and to share our findings online. We exchanged contact information and promised to stay in touch. As I drove home, exhaustion and fear battled within me. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was now a target, just like Whistleblower 51 and Seeker. But I also felt a strange sense of resolve. If what we had discovered was true, then the world needed to know. And I was willing to do whatever it took to uncover the truth. After the frantic night with Seeker, I returned home, my mind racing with questions and fear. Every creak of my house, every passing car outside, made me jump. I knew I needed to stay low, but I also needed to continue digging. The truth was too important to ignore. I decided to take a different approach. Instead of relying solely on the dark web, I began scouring public records and legitimate sources for any information that could corroborate Whistleblower 51's claims. I found nothing directly linking Area 51 to the experiments he described, but there were plenty of obscure references to advanced research and classified projects that piqued my interest. Weeks went by and my paranoia grew. I felt like I was being watched. Sometimes I'd notice the same car parked near my house for hours, or I'd catch glimpses of people who seemed out of place. I kept my activities online to a minimum, using secure, encrypted channels to communicate with Seeker. One night, Seeker messaged me with urgency. I found something big, he wrote. We need to meet again, but it has to be somewhere safer. I've got a friend who can help. He sent me coordinates to a remote cabin in the woods, a few hours' drive from my place. We agreed to meet there the next night. The drive to the cabin was tense. I constantly checked my rearview mirror, half expecting to see dark SUVs tailing me. When I finally arrived, the cabin looked deserted. I parked my car a distance away and approached cautiously. Seeker emerged from the shadows, accompanied by an older man he introduced as Doc. Doc was a former government scientist who had worked on several classified projects before becoming disillusioned and going off the grid. Inside the cabin, Doc showed us a series of encrypted files he had managed to acquire. These files contained detailed logs of experiments conducted at Area 51. The more I read, the more horrified I became. One log described a series of tests on human subjects using the time travel technology. The subjects reported severe psychological and physiological side effects, including disorientation, memory loss, and even premature aging. Another set of documents detailed the cloning experiments. They had achieved a disturbing level of success, creating clones that were virtually indistinguishable from the original humans. The clones were subjected to rigorous training, their physical and mental capabilities enhanced to create the perfect soldiers. But the most alarming part was the AI integration. 
The documents described how the AI systems were implanted into the clones, giving them the ability to learn and adapt at an unprecedented rate. The AI-controlled clones could execute complex missions with ruthless efficiency, devoid of any moral hesitation. Doc explained that the AI technology was far more advanced than anything publicly known. It was capable of making autonomous decisions, learning from its environment, and even developing its own strategies. It's not just about creating soldiers, Doc said. It's about creating a new form of life, one that's controlled and directed by the government. As we absorbed this information, the gravity of the situation hit us. This wasn't just about secret experiments. It was about the potential creation of an entirely new species, one that could be used for purposes we couldn't even imagine. Suddenly, our discussion was interrupted by the sound of approaching vehicles. Doc's face went pale. They found us, he said. We need to leave now. We grabbed the documents and hurried out the back, disappearing into the dense forest. We could hear the shouts of men and the barking of dogs as we ran, our hearts pounding with fear. After what felt like hours of running, we finally stopped to catch our breath. Doc led us to a hidden bunker, a relic from the Cold War era. It was small but well stocked, with enough supplies to last us a few days. We huddled inside, trying to come up with a plan. We need to get this information out, Seeker said. But we can't just dump it online. We need to find a way to make people believe it, to show them that this isn't just some conspiracy theory. Doc nodded. We need to find credible sources, people who can verify this information and help us expose it. But that's not going to be easy. The government will do everything they can to silence us. As we discussed our next steps, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were in way over our heads. But there was no turning back now. We had seen too much and we knew too much. If we didn't act, these experiments would continue unchecked, with potentially catastrophic consequences. Over the next few days, we worked tirelessly, contacting journalists, scientists, and anyone else we thought might be able to help. We used encrypted communications and burner phones, trying to stay one step ahead of our pursuers. It was a constant game of cat and mouse with no guarantee of success. One evening, we received a breakthrough. A well-known investigative journalist, someone with a reputation for exposing government stuff, agreed to meet us. He had connections and resources that could help us bring the truth to light. The meeting was set for the next night at a secluded location. As we prepared for the meeting, a sense of hope mixed with dread filled the air. This could be our chance to expose the truth, but it could also be a trap. We had to be careful, but we also had to take the risk. The stakes were too high to do otherwise. The drive to the meeting place felt like an eternity. Every bump in the road, every distant headlight set my nerves on edge. Seeker, Doc, and I barely spoke, each lost in our thoughts and fears. The secluded spot we had chosen was an abandoned factory on the outskirts of a small town, far from prying eyes. We arrived early, scouting the area to ensure it wasn't a setup. The journalist, known only as Anderson, had a reputation for taking on risky stories but we couldn't afford to be careless. Finally, as the clock struck midnight, a single car approached. Anderson stepped out, a tall middle-aged man with a serious expression. You must be Seeker, he said, shaking hands with each of us. Let's get this done quickly. If what you've got is as explosive as you say, we don't have much time. Inside the factory, we set up a makeshift workspace. Doc pulled out the laptop and began showing Anderson the files. As he scrolled through the documents and videos, Anderson's eyes widened. This is incredible. If this is real, it's the biggest story of the century. It's real, Seeker replied. And we need your help to make sure the world sees it. Anderson nodded. I have contacts who can verify this, but we need to act fast. Once this goes public, they'll come down on us hard. We need to ensure it's too big for them to cover up. For the next few hours, we worked tirelessly, sending files to Anderson's trusted contacts, preparing a comprehensive dossier, 
and drafting a story that would blow the lid off Area 51's secret experiments. Anderson recorded interviews with Doc, Seeker, and me, capturing our firsthand accounts of the discoveries and the dangers we faced. Just as we were wrapping up, a loud crash echoed through the factory. Men in dark suits burst in, weapons drawn. Freeze! Don't move! One of them shouted. My heart raced as we raised our hands in surrender. They quickly confiscated the laptop and all our devices, destroying any chance we had of revealing the truth. You've meddled in things you don't understand, one of the men said, his voice cold and menacing. You're coming with us. They herded us into a black van, blindfolding us to prevent us from seeing where we were being taken. The ride was long and silent, filled with a growing sense of dread. When we finally stopped, they led us into what felt like an underground facility. The blindfolds were removed, and we found ourselves in a sterile, dimly lit room. A man in a lab coat stood before us, his face obscured by shadows. You've uncovered some very sensitive information, he said calmly, but there are things in this world that are better left hidden. Doc stepped forward. People have a right to know. You can't just bury the truth. The man sighed. Perhaps. But sometimes, the truth is more dangerous than the lie. You've seen what we're capable of. Do you really think the public is ready for that? Before we could respond, he motioned to the guards who escorted us to separate rooms. They interrogated us for hours, trying to extract information about who else knew and where we had hidden the data. Despite the fear and intimidation, we held our ground, revealing nothing. Days turned into weeks. They kept us in isolation, feeding us just enough to keep us alive, but not enough to give us strength. Occasionally, they'd come back with new threats and offers of leniency in exchange for cooperation, but we refused. One night, the routine changed. The door to my cell opened, and a guard motioned for me to follow. They led me to a different room, where Seeker and Doc were already waiting, looking worn but defiant. Anderson was there, too, looking surprisingly calm. I've negotiated a deal, Anderson said. They're going to let us go, on the condition that we never speak of this again. What about the information? Doc asked. They've destroyed it, Anderson replied. But I have backups hidden. If anything happens to us, the truth will still get out. The man in the lab coat entered the room. You're free to go. But remember... We'll be watching. Any attempt to share what you've seen will be met with consequences. We were escorted out of the facility and released on the outskirts of a city, disoriented and weak but alive. Anderson had a car waiting and we drove in silence, each lost in our thoughts. The gravity of what we had experienced weighed heavily on us. In the weeks that followed, we tried to return to our normal lives, but nothing felt the same. We were constantly looking over our shoulders, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Anderson's story was never published, but he assured us that the backups were safe. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over. The truth was still out there, hidden but not forgotten. And as long as people like Whistleblower 51, Seeker, Doc, and Anderson existed, there was hope that one day the world would know the secrets of Area 51. Life after our release was a constant state of vigilance. Each of us tried to return to normalcy, but the weight of what we had uncovered and the constant fear of being watched made it nearly impossible. Despite the threats, we knew that the information we had was too important to be buried forever. I continued my research discreetly, avoiding any online activities that could be traced back to me. Seeker and I maintained contact through secure, encrypted channels, always careful about what we shared and how we communicated. Doc had gone completely off the grid, living in a remote area with no internet access. Anderson, true to his word, kept the backups hidden and safe, ready to be released if anything happened to us. Months passed and we heard nothing from our captors. It seemed like they had decided to leave us alone as long as we kept our silence. But the quiet made us restless. We knew that the secrets we held were too significant to remain hidden forever. 
One evening, I received an unexpected message from Seeker. I think I've found a way to get the truth out, he wrote. He explained that he had been in contact with a group of hackers known for exposing government stuff. They had the skills and resources to disseminate the information widely and anonymously, making it nearly impossible for the authorities to suppress. We arranged a meeting with the hackers, using all the precautions we had learned to avoid detection. The meeting took place in an old, abandoned church, its crumbling walls providing a stark reminder of the passage of time and the secrets held within. The leader of the group, a woman known only as Cypher, listened intently as we explained our situation. We can help you, she said, her voice steady and reassuring. But once this goes out, there's no turning back. You'll be putting your lives on the line. We exchanged glances, each of us understanding the risks, but also knowing that we had come too far to stop now. We're ready, Seeker replied. Over the next few days, Cypher and her team worked tirelessly, preparing the data for release. They created a secure website and a network of mirrors to ensure that the information would be accessible from multiple points, making it harder for the government to shut down. They also contacted trusted journalists and media outlets, providing them with the information needed to verify and report on the story. The night before the scheduled release, we gathered one last time. There was a sense of finality in the air, a recognition that our lives were about to change irrevocably. Anderson had prepared a comprehensive article detailing our journey and the evidence we had uncovered. This is it, he said, looking at us with a mixture of pride and apprehension. Tomorrow, the world will know. The release went off without a hitch. As the information spread, it quickly gained traction, with news outlets picking up the story and social media ablaze with discussions and debates. The revelations about time travel, cloning, and AI integration at Area 51 shocked the world. The government issued a series of denials, but the sheer volume of evidence made it impossible to dismiss entirely. Public opinion was divided. Some people believed us, others thought it was an elaborate hoax. But the important thing was that the information was out there, and people were talking about it. Whistleblower 51's warnings had not been in vain. In the aftermath, we took steps to protect ourselves. Seeker and I continued to live quietly, always wary of any unusual activity around us. Doc remained hidden, his knowledge too valuable to risk exposure. Anderson continued his work as a journalist, using his platform to advocate for transparency and accountability. The world had changed, and so had we. The secrets of Area 51 were no longer hidden, but their full implications were still unfolding. There were debates about the ethics of the experiments, the potential dangers of the technologies, and the need for oversight and regulation. One thing was certain, we had made a difference. The truth, once hidden in the shadows, was now in the light. And while our journey had been fraught with danger and uncertainty, we knew that we had done the right thing. As time passed, I often thought about Whistleblower and the courage it took for him to leak the information. His sacrifice had set us on this path, and his legacy was the truth we had helped to reveal. The world was watching now, and there was no turning back. And so, life went on. We remained vigilant, knowing that the fight for truth and justice was never truly over. But we also found solace in the fact that, against all odds, we had brought the secrets of Area 51 into the open, and that, we hoped, would make the world a better place.